Hey there, I'm Jonathan. And usually my time at Mech is spent in our children's program, Mech Kids. And in Mech Kids, we believe that church should never be boring. So doing something like what we're doing right now, just talking is uh, kind of unthinkable. <laughs> we play games, we uh, laugh, we have fun. And so you might see where I'm going with this. Today, I wanna start with the game. And to be honest, I have no idea whether this is gonna work or not, but we're gonna give it a shot together. Uh, this game is called Ninja Cats and the rules are very simple. I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to find a cat on the screen. Do that, you win. Don't, you lose. Are you guys ready to play? <laughs> All right, here's the first round. All right, how many of you found it? It's time for the next one. Okay, where's the cat? Okay, are you ready for the last round? Did you find the cat? <laughs> All right, great job. Thank you guys so much for playing that with me, by the way. Uh, I just need to get some of that, that kid time back, right? Uh, well, today's not about finding cats. Uh, instead, imagine if I asked you to look at your day. Could you find ways to be patient or kind or good? Well, that's what today's all about. We're continuing our series, Simply Christian, where we're looking at what the Bible says it means to just simply be a Christian. And the best picture of what Christianity should look like is found in a letter called Galatians in the Bible. It was written by a first century a Christian missionary named Paul. And, and here's what he said. He said, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. That's what it means to be simply Christian. And the language for that is key. These are fruit that are produced in us. That means they're not uh, achieved by human effort. Uh, this is, that means that it's not really like a, a target that we strive for. It's more like a mirror that we can compare our lives to, just a mirror of the kind of life that God could produce in you if you let him. So let's hold our lives to the mirror of the fruit of the Spirit. Last week, we looked at the first three, love, joy, and peace. And I would encourage you, if you weren't there, to go back and listen to that message. Uh, you can actually find it on the Mech app for free. Uh, but today is about the next three, patience, kindness, and goodness. And these three focus on our relationships to others, specifically our attitude towards others. So let's start by looking at patience. And when you think of patience, you probably think it's waiting until later for what you want now, right? Like waiting for a package to come or waiting in line. But the uh, Greek word that Paul used to describe patience here in the fruit of the Spirit is kind of different from that. It comes from the Greek makrothumia, which is more closely translated to being long-suffering, to enduring hardship and wrong without complaint or the thought of vengeance. In other words, choosing not to act when others fail you or provoke you. And this is the kind of patience that we all hate, right? <laughs> because it's our nature to react, to, to defend when offended, to fight when provoked. But patience is the opposite. Patience is bearing with others when they're inconvenient, unkind, or even downright mean without losing your composure. I've always found military training fascinating, and I've read a lot about the Marine Corps and training in the Marine Corps. And one writer was talking about how the worst failure in their mind was to lose what they referred to as their bearing. Uh, so they were provoked mercilessly by their drill instructors for months, sometimes having as many as three people screaming in their face, spit flying. Why? Because maintaining your composure is crucial in combat when surrounded by casualties and the chaos of war. Keeping one's bearing could mean the difference between life and death, victory or defeat. The same is true when it comes to your life. Keeping your patience and not reacting quickly in anger is often the difference between living the simply Christian life or falling into hatred and sin. Be honest. Think about your last failure relationally. Was it because you waited too long to act? Took your time really to think about what you were gonna say before you spoke? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> if you're like me, it's the opposite. You've probably acted rashly. You fired off the email or the social media comment or the text before giving yourself space to stop and consider the wisest course of action. There's a great moment in the Bible that illustrates the importance uh, of patience, and it comes from the book of Judges. And in it, uh, we read about a man named Gideon, uh, who God called to lead his people, the Israelites, into battle against their enemies, the Midianites. They won the battle. But right after the battle, this happened. Then the people of Ephraim asked Gideon, why didn't you send for us when you first went out to fight the Midianites? And they argued heatedly with Gideon. But Gideon replied, what have I accomplished compared to you? God gave you victory over the commanders of the Midianite army. What have I accomplished compared to that? And when the men of Ephraim heard Gideon's answer, their anger subsided. The people of Ephraim, instead of being grateful at the defeat of their enemies, let their pride get to them. They felt insulted that Gideon had not initially included them in the fight. Also, they probably wanted a lot more of the plunder from the victory. So they aggressively and they wrongfully provoked Gideon and he responded in patience, calmly endured their attack, responded in kindness, included them in the victory, and the anger subsided. Well, a few generations later, a new leader emerged in Israel, Jephthah. Once again, God used him to lead the people into battle, this time against the Ammonites, and they won. Listen to what happened next. Then the people of Ephraim mobilized an army and sent this message to Jephthah. Why didn't you call for us to help you when you fought against the Ammonites? We're going to burn down your house with you in it. Jephthah replied, Well, I summoned you at the beginning of the dispute, but you refused to come. You failed. The people of Ephraim responded, You men of Gilead are nothing more than fugitives. So Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and attacked the men of Ephraim. In all, 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. Oh, okay. Be honest. When you hold your life up to the patience mirror, are you more like Gideon, patient when provoked, or Jephthah, good for a fight? I think we all deep down want to be like Gideon, patient when provoked, because if we're honest, who really wants to be known as an overly sensitive hothead who goes through life leaving a trail of bodies behind them, literally in the case of Jephthah? Because the consequences of impatience are real. Bad things happen when we lose our cool. It may not lead to the death of 42,000 human lives, but it definitely comes with a cost that none of us really want to pay. So how do you train yourself to be patient? Well, let's go to the Bible because there are three ways that the Bible says we can do this. And the first is to reflect on God's patience for you. Paul, the guy who wrote the fruit of the spirit that we're studying, wrote this in a letter to a church leader that he was mentoring. He said, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners. And then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Do you ever think about how much patience God needs for you? Paul was acutely aware of the patience that God had for him. But if you're like me, you probably don't think that way. I mean, most of us think that we are reasonable, easy to live with people. And so the idea of God needing patience with us is it's kind of a weird idea. But think about it. Last week, we talked about the importance of going to God for forgiveness and, and, and how he'll forgive us for every single one of our sins, no matter how often we screw up. Okay, I screw up a lot. <laughs> how much patience does it take to forgive and forgive and forgive? the same sins over and over. There are times where I feel like if I was God, I would just give up on me as like a lost cause. Like, oh, there goes Jonathan running around lying again or something. There's actually a, a parable that Jesus told that I think is a good illustration of this in action. Um, it's from the book of Matthew. Here's what Jesus said. He said, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants who had borrowed money from him. Now, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and he begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him just a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat, demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him, begged him for a little more time, saying, be patient with me and I will pay it. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, 
and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. Then the king called in the man that he had forgiven, and he said, you evil servant, I forgave you the tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Okay, Jesus was making this point. God has unending patience with you and your faults. How unthinkable would it be to fail to have patience with someone, with someone else? Reflect on the depth and the breadth of God's patience for you. And then see his patience fill you with patience for others. Well, after you reflect on God's patience for you, pray and ask God for patience. One of my favorite prayers in the Bible is this exact prayer. Uh, here, here's the background. Uh, the people of God, the Israelites, were enslaved in Egypt. So God sent a man named Moses and, and through him, 10 plagues, each progressively worse than the last. Until finally, Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, just set the Israelites free. Moses then led his people to the promised land, but the people rebelled, uh, refusing to go in for fear of the people that were living there. So then they wandered in the desert for 40 years. Moses, their leader, the entire time. Uh, during that time, this pattern emerged with the people that Moses was leading. The people would complain about something. Ah, we don't have water or we don't have food. It was constant. And every single time Moses prayed to God and God came through, delivered exactly what the people wanted. He sent water from a rock. He rained down manna, sweet bread from heaven. So let's pick up the story in the book of Numbers, chapter 11 in the Bible. Then the people of Israel began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. We had all the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic that we wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna, you know, the, the sweet bread from heaven. Uh, Moses heard all of the families standing in the doorways of their tents whining. And the Lord became extremely angry. And Moses was also very aggravated. And then Moses said to the Lord, and I love this next part, why are you treating me, your servant, so harshly? Have mercy on me. What did I do to deserve the burden of these people? Did I give birth to them? Did I bring them into the world? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms like a mother carries a nursing baby? How can I carry them to the land that you swore to give to their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep whining to me saying, give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that Moses was at the end of his rope, at the end of his patience. But what did he do? He brought it to God. Do you do that when someone gets on your last nerve? Do you bring it to God? If you're like me, you probably don't. Uh, instead, you go to other people complaining about them. In college, uh, there was this guy who meant well, but uh, just rubbed everyone the wrong way. And uh, we talked about him a lot behind his back. Um, until finally, one of my friends stood up and just said, guys, we need to stop. Uh, this is bad. This is toxic. She was right. The key to being patient is to bring your frustrations to the right person to God in prayer. Well, then after you bring it to uh, prayer uh, to God uh, comes step three. Reflect on how God sees that person. There's one passage in the Bible that I think if we really let it sink in, it, it would transform the way that we treat one another. It's, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Let that soak in. God created humans in his image, which means you're not just a mass of cells that can walk and talk. You were purposefully created by a loving God. And more than that, you reflect the very image of that God. And what's more, every single human being that you come into contact with bears the image of God also. Now, now that has huge implications for life. So instead of seeing people as annoying or, or a nuisance, we need to see them as a precious reflection of God. I've not always been very good with this. Um, <laughs> I already talked about my uh, failures in college. Let's go back further with my failures with patience. Um, when I was in high school, uh, there was a guy in my circle who had a physical and an intellectual disability. And initially I was really nice to him. 
I reached out, I was actually one of the few who did, and he was a very eager friend, and honestly, a very good friend. But I began to grow annoyed. Uh, I grew tired of waiting for him to finish a thought, so I began to find ways to avoid him, to exclude him. I, I talked about how annoying he was behind his back. Um, over time, I grew cold and, frankly, mean towards him. He wasn't an idiot. He took the hint. We stopped hanging out. I regret the way I treated him to this day. Um, I failed him. Uh, a precious child of God made in his image, fearfully and wonderfully made. I saw him as an annoyance. It takes a lot of arrogance, right? I mean, I mean, who am I that I can judge God's child, a person with God's image in that way? I, who, who have been deeply forgiven so much. So hold your life up to the mirror of patience. Do you have anyone in your life that you struggle to be patient with? Okay, reflect on how patient that God is with you. Then bring all of your frustrations and struggles about that person to God and only to God. And then pray for what you don't have, patience. And then begin the hard work of seeing him or her the way that God sees them, as a precious child made in his image. Now, I, I do want to be clear. You're not called to bear with or be patient with aggressive, uh, dangerous, illegal, or abusive behavior. Like, okay, well, you know, my, sp my uh, spouse beats me, but I need to be patient with them. Or, you know, my boyfriend yells at me, but God wants me to be patient with them. Or, you know, they do illegal drugs, but no, no. God's not going to ask you to put up with abuse or, or dangerous or aggressive or illegal behavior. You are called to separate relationally from that. But patience does involve not fighting back not stooping to their level. For example, an internet troll should be blocked, yes. But God asks you to be patient with them and not troll them back. Never respond with anger, abuse, or yelling yourself. Don't add sin to sin. But those instances truly are few and far between. The vast majority of situations we face are with people who are just different or annoying or frustrating. People who provoke us, usually unintentionally, and just simply require the long-suffering patience that we've been talking about. So be patient with them. One of my favorite authors, uh, Jeffrey Mannion, wrote this, and it really stuck with me. He said, The way we are with each other is the truest test of our faith. How I treat a brother or a sister from day to day, how I react to the sin-scarred wino on the street, how I respond to interruptions from people I dislike, how I deal with normal people in their normal confusion on a normal day may be a better indication of my reverence for life than the politics I vote for. Okay, that's patience. Let's move on to kindness. Uh, in South End, uh, my wife and I's favorite uh, neighborhood to visit in Charlotte, there's this mural, a huge heart wall mural. And front and center in one of the hearts is the phrase, be kind. And that's become the mantra of our day, right? Largely because of the work of Ellen DeGeneres. She, she built her brand on that phrase, setting herself up as the queen of nice, which made it all the more surprising when it was discovered that there were reports depicting her workplace as a toxic pool of racism, sexism, sexual misconduct, and garden variety cruelty. But the reality is that we all desire to be kind, but it's not just Ellen who fails. Christians fail at this all the time too. And in the first week of the series, I discussed how some churches and Christian organizations, much like Ellen's show, have been revealed to be toxic institutions. Christians in politics are just as bad, if not worse. For many, looking at Christianity from the outside, we are marked by words like divisive, <clears throat> judgmental, hypocritical, unloving, mean-spirited, filled with anger, power-hungry, exploitive, misogynistic, selfish, kindness? It's not one of the words that's used to describe us that often. But Jesus calls us to be kind. And I think we all want to be kind, right? I mean, really, which of us actually wants to be known as a mean-spirited, tight-fisted, unkind, miserly human? No, when, when you put it that way, of course not. <laughs> but, but think about it. At, at the end of your time on this planet, don't you want people to say that you were a kind person who treated others well? So let's hold our lives up to the kindness mirror by looking at a story that Jesus told. Here it is. Uh, 
beginning with the setup of the story, is recording the biography about Jesus written by a historian named Luke. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbors as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you'll live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? Jesus replied with the story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over, looked at him lying there, but he also passed by the other side. And then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and, and bandaged them. And then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay the next time I'm here. Now, <clears throat> which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said, yes. Now go and do the same. A story tells us two things about kindness. First, kindness is costly, but no matter the cost, we are called to do it anyway. In that time, if you touched a dead body, uh, in Jewish law, you were considered ceremonially unclean. And to become ceremonially clean again, you'd have to go through ritual cleansing, which would cost time, and offer sacrifices, which cost money. That's why the first two Jews, the priest and the temple assistant, did nothing. They saw the cost and they decided it wasn't worth it. The Samaritan though, took time from his journey, spent large amounts of money and did it all willingly just for simple kindness. Would you do that? Maybe for someone that we know or, or love, but that brings us to the second thing about this story that it shows us about kindness. Kindness is something that we are called to do regardless of who the recipient is. I want to reread the entrance of the Samaritan into the story. Jesus said, Then a despised Samaritan came along. Jesus called him despised because that's what Jews would have called them. Samaritans were seen as, as spiritual traitors, uh, Jews who had intermarried with people of another religion and, and race, betraying their heritage. It was to the point that Jews would call Samaritans dogs or, or even half-breeds, which means no Samaritan would be expected to show kindness to a Jew. Jesus' point? Show kindness, even if you'll gain nothing from it. The Samaritan could expect to gain nothing from showing kindness to a Jew but he did it anyway. That's kindness. So often we think about Christianity as not doing things like, okay, don't steal, uh, don't hurt other people, but inaction is just as bad. The Bible says this in the book of James. It says, remember it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So hold your life to the kindness mirror. When was the last time that you said an encouraging word to someone, gave a gift for no reason, made someone a meal, uh, sent an uplifting letter, helped someone with a work project, uh, cleaned up after a meeting, gave, gave money to a charity, helped a neighbor with their yard work, visited an elderly shut-in, uh, tipped extra just because, bought ice cream for the family behind you in line. Imagine what our world would be like if we did those kinds of things. So how can you build this into your life? Well, first, it, it starts with seeing God's kindness to you. Jesus said in the book of Luke, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, do to others what you would like them to do to you. Love your enemies, do good to them. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for He is kind. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. God is kind to you. How often do you think about that? I don't. But the more that I do, the easier it becomes to be kind to others. Why? Because I know that I'm going to be okay. 
Paul, the writer of Galatians, says in another letter, um, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all that you need. And then you will always have everything you need, plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. You will never be able to outgive or outkind God. Yes, kindness is costly, but we have a God who will supply everything that you need. But but here's the rub. I, th I think we all naturally have a scarcity mindset. Like, like if I give my time or, or my money or my whatever, I, I'll lose. Yes, I should give, but it, it costs me. Uh, I see someone in need and instead of rushing to help, I think, oh, do I have time for that? God wants you to leave your scarcity mindset and adopt an abundance mindset. Because God promises that the more that you give, the more that you're kind to others, the more he will make sure that you are cared for. Now, this isn't some health or wealth thing, like be kind and you'll be rich. And well, actually, it's, it's kind of like that, actually. You might not be rich monetarily or successful in your job or, or live a really long life if you're kind to others, that's true. But kindness will always lead to richness where it matters because God promises that your good, your good deeds will be rewarded, whether on earth or in heaven. Also, God's not saying that you have to spend every single waking moment seeking uh, to serve others at the detriment of your physical health or your family security, you know, like selling everything and living homeless on the street. No, no, but be honest. Do any of us actually think that's the real danger? Like, oh no, I might be too kind or too generous. No, <laughs> the real danger that we face is to see kindness as only viable when it costs nothing. As if there isn't a God who promises to show you kindness, to enable and empower your kindness to others. Well, the next step is to pray. Pray that God gives you the opportunity to be kind and that he makes you the kind of person who will take advantage of those opportunities, no matter what the cost. And I really wanna chase the idea of prayer right here. Um, the Bible is filled with radical, crazy promises from God about prayer. Uh, listen to just this one uh, from the book of 1 John. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Okay, God promises that whatever we ask according to his will, he'll give us. Which begs the question, why don't we get more of our prayers answered, right? Now, there are many reasons for this, and, and we could do a whole series just on prayer, but I think one of the main reasons God does not give us what we ask for in prayer is because we ask for the wrong things. He promises uh, to grant our requests if they're in accordance with his will. But the will of God for your life is moral. It's your character. The Bible says in the book of Micah, O oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's God's will, to follow him, allowing him to turn you into a person of character. But usually our prayers suggest that God's will is about our happiness. Think about it. We pray for the promotion, to win the game. To, to get the girl, to achieve our goals, to be healed physically, to have pain removed, to get well-behaved kids. Now, those aren't bad things to pray for. God wants us to pray for everything. But why not pray for your character too? What if instead of just praying for God to help someone in need, you also prayed for God to show you how you could help them? Do you think he'd answer that? Yeah, because that's his will. That's his goal for your life. So, so, so pray, pray for opportunities to be kind and pray that God makes you the kind of person who obeys when given the opportunity. Third, to increase kindness in your life, see other people as image bearers of Jesus Christ himself. When he was on earth, Jesus told this story to illustrate this. He said, but when the son of man comes in his glory, he will separate the people as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He'll place a sheep at his right hand 
and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or feed you or thirsty or give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it for one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Jesus' point was clear. Every human has value and worth because they bear the very image of God, of Jesus Christ. The kindness that you do for the least of humans, you do for Christ. And I really wanna comment on the least. See, I like to see people as Christ by finding something good about them that's noble and honorable and saying, you know what, that's why I should be kind to them. Like they're really a good person underneath. Okay, God says even if that person has nothing redeemable that you can find, they are still an image bearer. And if they're in need, you're called to treat them with kindness. Even if they're a Jew and you're a Samaritan and you hate each other. If that makes you uncomfortable, just wait because it's time to talk about the final fruit of the Spirit for today, goodness. We tend to think of kindness as the ultimate goal of human interaction, like my job is to be kind, and if I'm kind, then that's it. I win life, right? God disagrees. He wants you to take it a step further. He wants goodness. Kindness sees a need and does the deed. It helps those that we come into contact with. Goodness seeks out actively ways to be kind. A, a life of goodness is a life on mission to, to bring the goodness of God to everyone and, and everywhere. A kind person helps a homeless man get a warm meal. A good person seeks out ways to help the homeless find worth and dignity through a relationship with Jesus and a sustainable way of life that allows them to break the cycle of poverty. A, a kind person is a father to their children. A good person seeks out kids who need a father figure to fill that void in their life. A, a kind person shuts down sexist talk in the office. A good person seeks ways to help end the exploitation of women and sex trafficking in the world. D do you get the difference? Listen to how Jesus described God's call for Christians to be good. Uh, he said, you are like, you are a light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Christians are meant to be a light that actively beats back the darkness of this world through our good deeds. So hold your life to the goodness mirror. When was the last time you actively sought out a situation where you could do good for others? What kind of a light are you? A personal flashlight that does kind things for the people who just happen to stumble onto your path? Or are you a city on the hill that seeks out anyone and everyone around who, who may be in need? I, I'm gonna be honest. Um, this was the most uncomfortable section of, the uh, of this message for me to prepare. I feel like I'm a kind person in general. Like if I was going down the road and I saw a man hurting, I, I'd probably help them. I'm, I'm, I am a good Samaritan. But then I started thinking, do I purposefully go down roads looking for hurting people to help? Sure, I'd, I'd help someone in need if I stumbled onto them uh, or if God put them into my path, but, but, but do I seek them out? No. For years, I served as a lunch buddy through a mission partner that Mech has, and I ate lunch with um, a homeless, fatherless boy every single week for six years straight. Uh, then the pandemic happened. We had to stop. I haven't even tried to start that back up yet. I haven't even checked to see if the program is back up and running for the new school year. Every single month, I see serve days that Mech posts about for partners like Habitat for Humanity, Crisis Assistance Ministry, Hope Vibes, and Second Harvest Food Bank. Every single one designed to help me show God's love to the city around me if I would just participate. I've never signed up for one. 
ever. We did the nursing home ministry as a family before the pandemic two times. That's it. The sad truth of my life is that I love whenever other people are good. I expect other people to be good. I, I applaud when other people are good. But then I go home with my little flashlight life, never truly becoming the city on the hill that God meant for me to become. God's been deeply good to me. And he's given me the opportunity to be a light to the world through my good deeds. And, and I'm squandering it. And as, this isn't like, you know, in order to be a good Christian, you know, you, you have to do stuff for people all the time. It, it's that I, I really love God. And if I really love him, wouldn't I actively seek out ways to bring his goodness into the world? So how do we do this? Well, you're probably getting the pattern by now. It starts with reflecting on how good God is to you. There's a song in the Bible written by a king named David. And here's what it says. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. The Lord helps the fallen, lifts those bent beneath their loads. You give food as they need it. You satisfy the hunger and the thirst of every living thing. The Lord is filled with kindness. God is good. Let his goodness fill your mind. Well, then pray. And, and pray specifically that God would, would give you his heart for the world. Paul wrote this uh, to a young man he was mentoring in the Christian faith. He said, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. The ultimate good that God desires for the world is that everyone comes to know him and have their life changed by him. So pray that God would break your heart for what breaks his. Pray that he would inspire you uh, to, to move from a flashlight life to becoming a city on a hill, reaching the world with his goodness, not just kind deeds to the people that you run across, but a goodness that points the way to God who could change their life too. A, a God who offers them love and joy and peace. Uh, deeds that uh, point them to a God who promises to be with them, to, to, to care for them, and to make all things right for them in heaven if they would just believe. Pray for that goodness to shine through you. Well then, see other people as the image bearer of God. If you truly thought of all people as bearing the very image of God, would you be content knowing that people are mistreated or need or hurting or lonely or, or dying? Would you be content knowing that they might die apart from God, doomed to an eternity away from heaven? No. If you truly thought of people as bearing the image of God himself, you would see God's call to be a city on a hill as the greatest and most glorious and just most incredible call on your life. You would throw yourself into it with a passion, seeking out every possible good that you could do. Why? Because it would point people to the ultimate good, to God himself, so that they too could have their lives changed by him. So, do you want to be simply Christian? Reflect on God's patience, kindness, and goodness to you. Then pray that he produces that fruit in you. And then begin to see everyone the way that God does, as made in the very image of God himself. And there's actually a fourth step um, that I've kind of been dancing around a little bit uh, that should be understood, but it isn't always. And that's obey. Obey the Spirit follow his leading, and begin your journey of patience, kindness, and goodness. There's a story that we've told several times here at Mech in the past, so you may have heard it before, but I, I wanted to end with it. There was once a village of ducks. Every Sunday, they waddled into their duck church with their duck choir and their duck preacher. The duck preacher got up and told them, ducks, God has given you wings. 
With wings you can fly, with wings you can mount up and soar like eagles. No walls can confine you, no fences can hold you. You have wings. God has given you wings and you can fly like birds. And all the ducks shouted amen and marveled at the wonderful sermon. And then they all waddled home on their two legs. God has given you patience, kindness, and goodness. And with those, you can be a light to the world. Please don't waddle through this week. Do something today in obedience to the call of God on your life. I plan to start by calling a school that I haven't um, visited in two years. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for these challenging words from the Bible, the challenge of a life of patience, kindness, and goodness. I pray that you fill the, us with those and help us meet that challenge and be cities on a hill and not little flashlights going through life. And I pray for that in your name. Amen.